here 42 years ago and um, have been in Capel for the last 34 years. Uh, I spent 30 years with IBM and the last uh, 11 years after leaving IBM, IBM now stands for me. Uh, it means I'm by myself. I have my own uh, consulting firm. I uh, specialize in leadership and organizational effectiveness. So that's me. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now and start the uh, presentation. Just give me a second here to find it. Done a lot of Zoom work, but it's still, this part of it is always hard for some reason. Okay, it's telling me I'm sharing. And here we go. So I've entitled this Leadership in a Time of Turmoil because I, I can't remember very many times in my lifetime where I've seen more of a need for leadership at all levels. Um, the system, the society, the world is being stressed at levels that are rare and, and we haven't seen too many times, I think, in history, at least in, in my history. Um, so with that as a backdrop, here's kind of where we find ourselves. We are battling two diseases at once, one being COVID, uh, which has infected over 12 million people globally. It attacks the body, it attacks the major functions and organs of the body. Uh, there's resulted in over half a million deaths worldwide. Here in the United States, despite having only four and a quarter percent of the world's population, we've managed to have 25% of the cases and just around 24% of the deaths. So we're definitely outperforming uh, the rest of the world in, in a bad way. Uh, with regard to this disease. Um, on the other hand, here in the United States, we're fighting systemic racism, um, which has been with us for centuries and attacks much like COVID, the system uh, of, of our society and of our country. Um, it attacks it in many ways. We'll talk about some of the ways that it shows up but it's, it's, a, it's a different time and, and one that's gonna require a lot of folks to step up and, and lead by example in both instances. To talk about race, I think it's important <clears throat> to kind of take a look back. And what I've done is kind of picked out 20 what I'll call inflection points of America's history with race, going all the way back to 401 years ago when the first slave ships landed at Jamestown 157 years ago since the Emancipation Proclamation declared that all men should be free. 155 years, two years later, uh, the 13th Amendment was passed to say, hey, we're serious about this. Slavery is abolished. And 66 years since Brown versus Board of Education declared that schools should not be segregated. 65 years since Rosa Parks was arrested in Mobile for not wanting to give up her seat on the bus. 64 years since Emmett Till's brutal murder in Mississippi. 55, 56 years since the Civil Rights Act was passed, followed a year later by the Voting Rights Act. Uh, hard for me to believe that it's been 52 years since MLK was, was killed. 29 years since we all saw Rodney King beaten by a gang of police on the streets of Los Angeles. 12 years since Barack Obama's election as the nation's 44th and first black president. Eight years since Trayvon Martin, a 14 year old, walking the streets of, of Florida, uh, eating Skittles, was killed by a overzealous neighborhood watch cop. Um, seven years since Black Lives, was mad, uh, Black Lives Matter was launched in reaction to Trayvon Martin's killer, George Zimmerman, not being convicted for murder. Uh, six years since we saw the first 
I Can't Breathe victim of police brutality in, on the streets in New York, Eric Garner, for allegedly selling illegal cigarettes. Tamir Rice was a 12 year old in Ohio killed because he was playing with a toy gun in the park. Sandra Bland was pulled over in South Texas for not using a turn signal to change lanes. She subsequently died mysteriously in police custody. It's been four years since Colin Kaepernick, Kaepernick first took a knee and was vilified for doing so, even though he was given the advice to do so by a Green Beret who said, who advised him that that was an honorable way to protest. And in fact, what he felt soldiers fought for the right of Americans to do. Nine months since we saw Botham John and a Tatiana Jefferson murdered in Dallas and Fort Worth in their homes. Five months since Ahmaud Arbery was killed in uh, Georgia while jogging by three vigilantes. Uh, four months since Breonna Taylor was murdered in her home uh, as a result of a no-knock warrant uh, issued and, and executed with no probable cause in Louisville, Kentucky and 47 days since the flame that lit everything else on fire, George Floyd uh, being murdered on the streets of Minneapolis and, and again, videotaped. So for the past 29 years, we've seen this play out from Rodney King in terms of the video evidence. Uh, we've seen this play out time and time again, but George Floyd's situation seemed to ignite something different. Black Lives Matter, as, as a result of George Floyd's uh, situation, has now become a global movement. On the top left, you see a protest that happened in Fort Worth. And on the upper right, you see a protest that happened in Paris, France. The map down at the bottom shows all the places around the world where hundreds and probably even thousands of protests have taken place in the name of Black Lives Matter and in reaction to George Floyd's murder. To understand a little bit about why this reached the boiling point, I want to play a quick video that's narrated by an author and journalist by the name of Don Turner. It gives us a little different view or uh, food for thought around why this is showing up the way it is and how it may give us a glimpse into what poor Black communities feel every day as curfews in many cities are about to begin again tonight we're at a place where we don't need to go searching past events and expert opinions in order to understand the protests around the killing of george floyd we can analyze it first person tonight journalist and author dawn turner shares her humble opinion on why we all need to make a connection between the pandemic and the protests when I was a columnist for the Chicago Tribune, I often wrote about race in poor African-American communities. Many times, well-meaning white readers would ask me, what can I do? I want you to know that this pandemic has afforded you a vantage point like none other. This is your opportunity to know what people who live in poor communities face and feel every day, long before COVID. I want you to remember what it feels like to stand in long lines to enter stores. Because in poor black communities, some merchants fearing theft from a few bad apples have long restricted the number of people they allow in at one time. And those plexiglass dividers that protect store workers now, well, their bulletproof cousins have been mounted in stores in black communities for ages. I want you to remember the knot of anxiety you feel wondering whether there will be enough eggs or meat or even toilet paper on store shelves. Poor people living in food deserts face scarcity all the time. I want you to remember the unease of walking past boarded up businesses and jogging down barren streets because that's what poor black people who live in blighted communities experience every day. I want you to remember what it feels like to have to hole up in your house because the world beyond your door is dangerous and filled with people who could cost you your life. I want you to remember what it feels like to lose your job and not only to be stripped of vital income and all that entails, but of purpose and those connections that motivate and inspire us. 
I want you to remember how it feels to have to stand in line to ask for a handout and how you worry that people will ask you, how did you get yourself in this situation? If you take away nothing else from this pandemic, I want you to remember how powerless and hopeless and disaffected this moment has rendered you. I want you to realize that for poor Black people, this is not a moment. If this pandemic offers even a smidgen of empathy, then maybe you understand why people might rise up and rage. So that gives us a little different context for the situation we find ourselves in and how COVID has unmasked for many people some of the experiences that the Black community it sees and, and goes through on a daily basis. Systemic racism is, is a multi-layered, multi-tentacled kind of a thing. Um, in this particular graphic, it shows four categories. The first being personal, private beliefs, prejudices, prejudices and ideas that individuals have. Often these are uh, passed down through generations, through uh, stories, through imagery, through um, distorted history. Um, but there, this, is, this is at the personal level and people internalize those things and then that leads us to the second place where they start to act out through interpersonal expressions of racism between individuals. Um, these can be often deliberate, direct, and intentionally meant to hurt. And at other times, they can be totally innocent, um, not intended to hurt, and strictly a byproduct of a lack of understanding or knowledge. Institutional racism, on the other hand, is the discriminatory treatment uh, the enactment of policies and practices within organizations and institutions. Um, an example that comes to mind for me when I think about that one is uh, the, the, the redlining actions that were taken back in post-World War II. Uh, after the war, GI Bill was passed, given all kinds of benefits to veterans. Uh, black soldiers, when they came back from the war, did not enjoy those same benefits, partly because of a federal government program that was connected to the housing movement, which was huge at that point, that would not allow lenders to extend mortgages in redlined districts, which just so happened to be districts where majority minority uh, black neighborhoods tended to be. As a result, that has manifested itself in, in what we now today see as a huge disparity in the rate of home ownership um, along racial lines. So that's an institutional kind of uh, racism. Structural racism is where public policies and institutional practices and other norms perpetuate racial group inequality. So to think about those, you need no, go no further than things like redistricting, uh, gerrymandering as it's, as it's referred to, or you can think about voting uh, laws and practices where, for example, uh, voter IDs were required, and then all kinds of actions were taken to shrink the footprint of the number of places where people could obtain voter IDs, resulting in things that we just saw in Georgia, Kentucky, and other places where people end up standing in line for four to six hours to vote. I don't think that's anybody's definition of what a true democracy should look like. Income inequality is one of the places where this manifests itself very clearly. If you look at this slide, this was a study done by the Pew Research Center. This is 2016. And if you focus on the middle layer, it looks at median income by race. And you see white income, the top bar shows a median income of about 48,000. The next bar down is black, median income at 31,000. That is uh, roughly uh, 65 cents on the dollar kind of comparison. 
That, by the way, is up from 59 cents on a dollar back in 1970. So some progress, but clearly not enough. Women, by the way, on this same kind of a study show up at 80 cents on a dollar compared to men. So there's clear disparities, documented disparities in terms of, of income. And that forms the foundation for and the basis for this next category, which is wealth. So if you find yourself in a situation where your income is not up to par, you're gonna find yourself in a position where dollars are harder to stretch, where you're gonna have less opportunity to save, less opportunity to invest, et cetera, and certainly then less opportunity to pass down any assets that you might be able to acquire. On the left, you see a comparison of wealth by race between uh, 1983 and 2016. And in that 33 year period, white wealth uh, grew by roughly 30 plus percent over that 33 year period. Black wealth by contrast over that same period was cut in half. Uh, Hispanic wealth went up by again, roughly the same 30 plus percent rate. On the right, you see an even more troublesome picture, which shows uh, median household net worth by race and education. And what strikes me is if you look at the bottom left, you'll see that uh, a, a household where the leading earner has less than a high school degree, if they happen to be white, the median household net worth for that family is roughly $83,000. Which, is, which outpaces a black family where the leading wage earner has a college degree. So the disparities, you know, even at that bottom level, it's like 40 times different for white families than it is for black. And again, it goes back to this income equality thing compounded over years and decades uh, that manifests itself in, in these differences. This then also bleeds into health inequality. Black infant mortality is over twice the rate of that of white infants. One study showed that 67% of doctors have a bias against their African-American patients. This shows up in a difference in the way that they're treated, in the way they're prescribed for, um, and is, is, is a major issue in terms of, of healthcare uh, in this country. COVID has also unmasked the fact that Black people to this point have died at twice the rate of other races from COVID. And again, some of this is compounded effect of morbid conditions that, that, that plagued the Black community over the years and a lack of access to health care over the years that, that has had a compound effect. Criminal justice, Blacks make up 13% of the country's population, yet make up 40% of the prison population. One disturbing fact that has gotten better is back in the late 2009, 2010 uh, period, there was a study done that showed that there were more young Black males of college age who were in prison than there were enrolled in college. Uh, thankfully, those numbers have changed but the, and, and it's now, you, you do have more young black males enrolled in college, but the fact that those were ever out of balance to that point and are still within shouting distance of each other is problematic. Um, America, by the way, is the most incarcerating nation on earth. Um, black drivers, 30% more likely to be pulled over. Thus the, the term you may have often heard referenced as driving while black. Police killings, the Washington Post uh, has an interesting site that looks at police killings by state. Um, and overall, since 2015, they show that blacks are three times, two to three times more likely than whites to be killed by police in their lifetime. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, is this our tipping point? Is George Floyd's callous execution at the hands of four police officers the 
the, the, the point in time that's going to bring us to a point where we're going to have serious dialogue and take serious action toward addressing some of the disparities that have been built up over decades and centuries in this country. And that's, that's an open question, but the signs so far are that it's, diff it's a different time than we've seen in, in any recent period. So you remember in the beginning, I talked about leaders and the, and the need for leaders. Um, again, this is probably me, my view because of the work that I do, but I look at this as a classic leadership challenge and opportunity. Um, we need people to step up and, and step into leadership roles in this particular space. The one thing we know is that when kids are born, there is no racist gene. There's nothing about a child that comes out as racist. It's a learned behavior. It's a taught behavior. So if there's one place we can all use our influence is in making sure that children understand that nothing about skin color should be a determinant for somebody's future or how they're viewed. The other thought I think that's important for us to keep in mind it comes from a quote by Angela Davis, where she talks about the fact that in a racist society like we live in, it's not enough to be non-racist. Non-racists are people who say, well, I'm not racist, and you know, I don't agree with anything that those racists do. But they're relatively quiet, they don't speak up, they don't take action. We need people to become anti-racist much the way people are expected to be anti-Semitic. Nobody would tolerate people saying, oh, I, I'm, I'm not for the Nazis. I, I don't agree with them. That, that's, not, that's not enough. And so people are expected, society's expectation is that people should be anti-Semitic. And just like that, there's a need for people to be anti-racist and to use their voices accordingly. When, when I talk to leaders about their responsibility, particularly at the top of an organization, they are often in positions where they have access to more information, their titles bring them the opportunity to have relationships and influence at levels that most other people in the organization don't have. And as a result of that, I would submit that they have a responsibility, if not an obligation, to do three things. One is to ignite possibility for that organization, for the people in that organization. What could the future look like? They're in the best position to paint that picture and to get people then aligned and focused on how to go about going after that picture. And thirdly, they're the ones who need to think about the long-term viability of that organization because most people engaged in the day-to-day -day are not able to do that. And so that's, that's a big part of their role as leaders. I would submit to you that as citizens of this country, if we truly care about its future, we have these same, same three responsibilities when it comes to race and battling this systemic, this, this disease that's plagued this country for close to 400 years. So that's, my, uh, that's, that's the story. I hope that gives us a little bit of context and helps us think about this thing in some different ways. And I would now like to turn this over to, I'm gonna stop sharing here and bring up my fellow, the panelists. I'm gonna turn first to Jacqueline McCoy and ask Jacqueline to introduce herself, then I'll come to Jack and then to Alex. So Jacqueline. You're muted. Hi, I'm sorry. My name is Jacqueline McCoy, and me and my family have lived in Capel for over 25 years. Um, I'm originally from Louisiana, and I was born and raised there. I uh, went to college at Northeast Louisiana University. And I wanted everybody to know, I think we're telling you a little bit about us before we get started, but um, I was born in the 60s. And as a result of growing up during that time period, uh, my family was selected to have us participate in the integration of public schools in the 60s. 
Um, so in the first grade into the third grade, I was the only black student in my classes. Uh, my parents purposely decided not to explain to us what was going on with regard to segregation. And honestly, I feel we were too young to really understand what was going on. And in some ways, I'm glad they didn't tell us about it at the time because I could just be a kid and not be burdened with such a huge responsibility of changing the world. Um, the racism my family endured from that experience, I found out about later in life. And uh, I found I was given a small glimpse of the types of things that was directed toward them because of um, a allowing us to participate in that experience. It was either by way of retaliation for making that decision or a way to punish um, them for for making that decision. Um, I do feel as I've grown older that that experience has shaped the way I look at the world with regard to race and has allowed me to be very open-minded about accepting people on face value regardless of their race. So I, I, I'm raising, um, I've raised, should I say, two black uh, boys in Capel. So they went through the Capel CISD school system. Um, so glad to be on the panel and glad to speak with you about uh, my experience. And again, I'm Jacqueline McCoy. Let me unmute myself. Thank you, Jacqueline. Appreciate it. Uh, Jack? Uh, hello. Uh, I'm Dr. Jack Henderson, retired. I was born and lived my life in the state of Texas, in the country, United States of America. My life has taken me from Limestone, Bell, and McLennan County to Capel here in Dallas County. It is, it is important for me to establish some level of credibility to speak objectively about racism, both uh, through observation and personal experience. Keep in mind, individual perception plays a role in defining racism. Racism is what remains after one has eliminated other reasonable explanations for an action. I have volunteered with Kid Country Reconstruction Project Guard the Table Dinner, Carpeo Leadership Class, CISD I Lead, Allies Cohort 2 program, and serve on the Senior Advisory Committee. I hold bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees for studies at University of Phoenix, Stephen F. Austin, Baylor University, University of Houston, Paul Quinn College, and Harvard. My professional life covers 40 years in public education with a decade in the classroom and three decades in administration. I have presented at a national technology conference and have two city proclamations, one for education service and one for work with the homeless. Uh, I lived in the home of my parents until I was old enough for them to put me out. The standard was the same for all siblings, male and female. Once you received your high school diploma and reached the age of 18, it was time for you to go make your way in the world. You can be early, less than 18 years old, with a high school diploma but you could not be late. So at the age of 18, with a high school diploma in hand, I left home of my parents to make my way in the world. It was clear to me I was leaving the home of my parents to make my own home, and that was all right with me. Uh, I grew up at a time uh, when my, uh, the babies of the family, twin girls, they were able to begin uh, in, in uh, integrated schools back in 1960. In 1967, uh, almost all of the schools in the state of Texas integrated, so that would be the first year, uh, that was the first senior graduating class in 1968, started in 1967. Uh, I happened to be one of those uh, students. But prior to that, uh, I remember parents, I remember going hungry as a family for our parents and grandparents just save their money up to pay poll taxes in order to vote. That's how important it was. We had to go hungry at times so that those poll taxes would, made, would be paid so that uh, our parents, grandparents, uncles, aunties, they could all vote. That's how important they viewed voting was. Uh, that's my spiel at this point. Uh, kind of introduce myself and also to uh, uh, justify me being able to speak uh, openly and, and clearly uh, based on my experience. 
Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Very much appreciated. But Alex, let's hear from you. Oh, hello. Um, my name is Alex Wright. I am a Kapar resident of I guess it's five years now. Uh, <clears throat> a little bit about my background, where I come from. Um, I was originally born in Jersey City, New Jersey, and one of in the in 79, in the late 80s, or the early 80s, I'm sorry. Um, it was one of the worst projects in the city at the time. Um, and then, so my story really comes from, my family story comes from, if you would say the things that Lawrence, you kind of talked about throughout, I mean, in your, um, in your presentation, really, we were kind of, my family was a, was the effects of those things that kind of happened of institutional racism um segregation and things of that nature um my great great grandmother uh, was actually from south carolina and she was a a daughter of slaves and growing up i believe in her late 20s or so she had three kids and these and two uncles two of my great grand uncles and one of my great and my great grandmother um which happened to be um, her kids were from a white man. And at the time back then, um, she wasn't married and this white man had kids of his own. He had a family of his own. So back then it was very common for men back then to have other families across, across the tracks. And my great grandmother was one of those women. And so she pretty much raised these three kids on her own. Um, and my grandmother, you know, and, and that's, and that's where I come from. And, you know, they got sent away from South Carolina to New Jersey, um, where she grew up. And then she had 11 kids and so on and so on into my family. And the really the ramifications of that, the reason why I bring that up is because it really talks about the breakdown of the family structure and the black community um, after um, slavery, after reconstruction. So, you know, where I come from, I didn't come from the benefits of having that family structure um, to succeed generations through our generations that most Americans, most foreign Americans, most people have in every part of the world. Um, so that was a test that I kind of faced growing up as a kid, growing up in the projects, seeing my mother do drugs, seeing my father do drugs, my father and mom in and out of jail for drugs, selling drugs, things of that nature and stuff. Um, and then, I had an opportunity to move to Texas to come live with my grand aunt, not even my aunts, my grand aunts, to give me better opportunities to see things in a different light, to see, to learn different experiences and things of that nature, um, which kind of led me through um, going through the schools in the Dallas area, then going to college, meeting my wife, coming to Capel, living here, and my story is now. So now um, I have a master's degree from the Keller School of Management. Um, I have three wonderful sons. Uh, my wife is Iranian American. We've been married for going on 11 years now. And um, that's really it. I mean, that's really it. Um, the things that, the, how I was able to make something of myself coming from that family structure, I think is, I give some weight to the conversation about the challenges that the community still faces to this day by having the breakdown of the family structure through slavery um, reconstruction, Jim Crow, civil rights, and so on and so on, even till today, um, the challenges that we still face. Um, so I guess that's it for now. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate it. Um, we only have, so we need, we need, we're 50 people signed on here. We need you all to get busy. We have, we have uh, one compliment from an anonymous attendee who said, thank you. And then we have two questions. So I, I need, we need more questions. Um, but the first question I'll go to here is um, from Subu. And I, Subu, trust me, being from Louisiana, you don't want me to try to pronounce your last name. So we're gonna leave it at Subu. Um, why is there a lack of African-American representation in the Senate 
with only one African American from um, South Carolina in the Senate, how can that change? So I'll turn to my panel and ask if anybody wants to try to take that one. Not all of us. Lawrence, please. That, yes. That's really, that's actually a one word answer to that. And that is, well, maybe a little bit deeper than that. Vote or take somebody to vote, help people get to the polls, move high waters, climb mountains, whatever you need to do, but vote. Vote changes everything. And there are challenges facing the uh, drawing of lines. That gerrymandering is very real. If you study any of the voting uh, maps, it's crazy how they draw around certain neighborhoods in order to weaken your vote. So you have to be very conscious of that and uh, make sure that with the census that we get everybody counted, every head in the country counted, because that determines so many things, funds, number of representatives, but as far as the Senate goes, vote. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Jack. Anybody else? Well, and also um, around that same um, area of voting, the, as far as the Senate is concerned, the states, of course, only get two senators per state. And if you look at the population distribution of the states, um, you have states that have a larger um, Caucasian population, such as some of the uh, northern states. Um, so that's going to be a, a factor as well as mobility. Um, that drives, you know, whether you're going to have representation um, in the Senate, at least, as far as what, what the representation will be, is population mobility. Absolutely. Absolutely. The The only other thing I would add to what I think are two great answers is the, the fact that relative to the rest of the country, black people are still fairly young in terms of being able to participate in this thing called democracy. And so relative to the 240 some, some odd years of history that the country has, uh, black people have only been able to participate in this for a little over 50. So in that time, it takes time to grow people up through the ranks to be qualified to compete. You know, as an example, right now, we have uh, Royce West, who is running for the Senate, as it just so happens, to have the right to run against John Cornyn. I don't know if Royce will win or not, but it's noteworthy to see, because it's so different to see a candidate, particularly in Texas, for the Senate um, be a black, be a black candidate. So things may be changing, but it takes time, particularly in the Senate, which is only a hundred folks and two seats per state. Those don't flip very often. And when they do, it's a, it's a very, very tough competition. So let's it also, see. yep. Alex, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It also takes an effort of being active participants in the system itself, as black people, as people of minority backgrounds all over, black, Hispanic, Asian American. Um, if you want the representation, the representation that, that, we, that we want to see, um, we have to be actively participant in it. Um, for so long, you know, in the black community, it's like, that's them, we'll let them deal with it. You know, it's not going to change us. You know, we're poor already. We're disenfranchised already. We have this mentality that we constantly think. So we automatically just disregard, not just black people, but if you look at just the voting population in the United States, I think we're a population of what, 350 million or so. If you look at the national election, we have what, 80 million, less than 100 million people voting. So if you think about a third of the country's voting period, who, who can vote? Um, so it just takes more engagement of really understanding that, you know, what power we have as individuals and stuff. You know, it's, it's really tough. Let's just say if you live in the state of Texas, like, oh, Texas, you know, it's a Republican state. 
or if you live in California, oh, California's a democratic state, my vote doesn't really matter. That mentality we have, we have to really get out, not just for black people, for all type of people, but in particular in this matter of like why um, black people represent in the US Senate. Yeah, I think if we ourselves as a people really come together, um, we really have power to really make that change and really engage. Um, voting is one way engaging, being part of a party or a group that they do facilitate many things and stuff in different counties, starting at your local elections um, to your state elections and then also to the national elections. So it's, it's work. And I think if we do this work, um, we'll see the benefits and the fruits of it. Because um, the way that I look at it, like I sit back and I look at everything and I see how, you know, a group of people, you know, they have a, as you say, power or yeah, really what it is power, this voting power that they have and what they're doing with it. I'm like, hey, if I was them, I probably would want to try to keep as much power as I want to, too, you know, from their perspective. But at the same time, I think we have to realize that the government, our system of government, however it is, if we think it's bad or not, it's, it's really our place to really change it and to make it work for the people itself. So. Great. Thank you, Alex. Um, I'm going to jump to one here from John. He says, when addressing the community, how do I address um, Black people? Should I use Black, African-American, or other identification? So I'll open that, up, open that one up. I don't really have a, a preference, meaning if you call me Black, that's fine. If you call me African-American, that's fine. I think um, you may find that people do have a strong leaning one way or the other. So I, I think myself personally, I feel it, it, either one is acceptable. Okay. Others may have a different opinion, but <clears throat> excuse me, but I don't, I don't have a personal opinion about that. Um, sometimes I interchange those. So I think, I think they're pretty interchangeable. I agree. Okay. I will address that uh, on a personal level. Being a Black American, recognizing Black, that rings true to me. Now, the term African American has grown to mean uh, much more than Black Americans. Now, we have people that immigrate from the African continent that actually know what country they originated from. And I've had expressed to me questions as to why uh, in the United States everybody's thrown into one group. Well, uh, and they identify with the country of the origin. I have no clue about my country of origin. My country of origin is the United States. Sure, surely it's obvious that uh, my ancestors would have come from the country of Africa. I even had a neighbor suggest that, well, why don't you go through one of those ancestry things and ancestry sites or companies, and they'll tell you what part of Africa you come from. And I asked, why would I want to know that? I don't need to, that's not something that I need to know. And uh, I sympathize with those, with the new immigrants from the African continent in the African area that's thrown into that uh, uh, African-American umbrella, I understand their point of view. And I also hope that they respect and understand my point of view that I'm a Black American because my connection was long ago, lost such a long time ago, uh, I have a problem with it at times. I don't make a deal out of it. Uh, but I wanted to make sure I put that in there to acknowledge the feelings that have been expressed to me from some of the newer immigrants from off of the African continent. Okay, thanks, Lawrence. Thank you, Jack. So um, I, th I think the, the net answer is it varies. Uh, my personal opinion is the safe zone is probably Black people. Um, using the term Black is probably safe. And there is a there's a view related to Jack's point from folks who still live in Africa who say, you know what, keep the African part out. <laughs> you guys are Americans. 
Um, so there, there's different views on that, and, and I think different views within the community, but the safe zone to me is, is black. Um, here's one that talks to, this one's specific to Capel. I'm not sure if anybody's going to be able to answer this, but I'll tee it up. What are the, what are the diversity inclusion goals for Capel? Also, who is the leader for diversity in Capel? That one might be a stump the band question. I don't, I don't know what the goals of diversity and inclusion of and Capel are. Um, I would, I would assume there is. You know, um, they want diversity and inclusion, inclusion. But just for the leader, I would, you know, I would stab to say that it would be the mayor. You know, um, of of being. It's not necessarily that they have the power to will and to say do this and do that, but to really push the goal forward of inclusion and diversity in Capel. So I would, I would look personally towards the mayor to do that um, in general. And then I know we also have um, a program in Capel that Jack and I participated in called Allies in Community. And their goal is to um, extend an opportunity for people to reach out and communicate with people of diverse races and backgrounds. Um, the community has a goal of sending the uh, community employees through that program. So I don't know what the, the measurable aspects of that is, but I know that they are um, asking their city employees to participate in this program, um, which allows them to meet people from, as I said, diverse backgrounds. Um, so I know that initiative is in place and it's called Allies in Communities. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Um, okay, here's one. What policies of institutionalized race, systemic racism have directly affected the breakdown of black families since 1960? Well, one of one of the one of them pertains to education. Um, I mean, when there is a, a discussion around whether the integration of the school systems benefited the African American race versus um, not integrating. And of course, in the 60s, you know, we did start integration. Um, but, but basically, education, it, there's a disparity, as uh, Lawrence did in the introduction, between education and being not educated. It makes a big difference down the road with regard to income disparities. Um, Poverty, health—it has just a, a ripple, a triple, a ripple effect of of education not being equal um, in our society. But as I said, there's also um, controversy about whether that action was somewhat to the detriment of the black community. Because, to be quite frank, um, the thought process was that you sort of diluted um, the focus on black education because. If you look at um, history and, and pertaining to people that are older, that uh, are in the society, you, you have co people who contributed to the society that went to predominantly black schools. And so you have, and, and so you have to ask yourself, um, if we see less representation um, of black students advancing and, and that kind of thing, now that we have integrated schools, is, was that, a benefit that we decided to integrate schools or did we in some way um, dilute the process? And that's just, that's an open controversy, but um, I think that's an institutionalized piece of racism that um, we attempted to address, I think, by integrating schools, but sometimes there's questions as to whether or not that was actually the best thing that we did in history. Okay, thank you. Anybody else, Jack or Alex? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll comment on that. Um, I attended segregated school all the way through 11th grade. My senior year was the integrated year. Uh, now, uh, and we, in that regard, uh, when immigration came along, that was a huge setback in the education of, of, of uh, black students. Now, how did it come about? 
basically all of the black educators lost their jobs. Now that would be a token or two here or there, but they lost their jobs. So instantly, uh, as a black uh, student, you had challenges to meet uh, once you uh, uh, showed up at the schoolhouse and all of your teachers were white. So that was a somewhat of a disconnect there. And there were uh, practices put into place that actually, uh, um, lack of a better way of putting it, put you in your place. It was the first thing that took place was that we were all administered tests. And the tests covered words that we had no reason to know, such as escalator. There was no escalator in the country, so there was not a need to know escalator. Red bugs uh, uh, was how we knew uh, uh, um, cheat, 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 cheaters, cheaters. And I thought, wait a minute, we didn't like the sound of that word anyway. See, so uh, there were certain sex facts there. Now, but there were also some pluses involved there in that uh, there were a few true teachers, true educators that had the philosophy that they would teach anyone that showed up. Uh, one of them even expressed his, uh, his concern that, or uh, his position that he could teach a monkey if a monkey showed up. Now, uh, quite a few of my classmates took his, uh, offense to that. Well, uh, I wasn't particularly happy about it, but he was true to what he said. He taught us, he recognized our shortcomings and he taught us. I come to have a great respect for that gentleman. And years later, he tried to recruit me to come work for him. Uh, and uh, which, of course, told him that I need to be in a larger town uh, because they paid better. And I didn't want to have to do all of the extra jobs just to make ends meet. So those are the type of challenges that we, that we faced uh, at that time when immigration came along. Now, it took 20 years before uh, black educators started to really work themselves back up through the system into position, decision-making positions. That's, uh, those are some of the things that I experienced personally. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jack. Alex? Uh, I'm trying to find the question again, because I want to, what was the question again? The question was, was about 19. Uh, it, it had to do with what, kinds of institutionalized racism have had an oh, impact yes. on black families, the destruction or the- Yes, so, so I can speak on this personally. Um, I would say the war on drugs, um, the crime bills of that time. Um, my, mom and, my mom and dad were in their early 20s, I would say in the in the eighties or so. And you know, they had five kids and I was one of them. And, you know, back then people in their twenties, just like most of America in the eighties, you know, drugs was the big thing. Cocaine. My, you know, they grew up in the Northeast in New York. My father was an accountant. Um, um, he went to school for that. He, he, he got his associate, I believe in that or so. He was, he, he worked down, downtown Jersey city. And, you know, just like anyone, you know, drugs became prevalent in the black community back then, especially in the projects. And that affected my family directly to where my mom and dad were on drugs. They were in and out of jail constantly um, because of drugs, selling drugs and using drugs. So when you talk about, okay, how does that affect, like, how is, how is that, like, how did that affect me? Well, you know, the laws for crack cocaine, which was a lot less than cocaine, powder cocaine, which was done using Hollywood in the upper suburban white areas of America, um, usually kind of a slap over wrist, not necessarily made a big deal about it, but you know, the crime bill, the drug war, you know, just say no, the whole Reagan era, the whole Reagan era and into the bushes affected us directly, really broke our family down. Um, it sent me to Texas. Now, I'm saying, hey, that's a good thing. You know, I'm here. I'm better myself. I see a different perspective. But it completely broke our family apart, you know, um, and to where now I have siblings 
who still struggle with that, who still struggle with other issues, um, and in their lives that can't seem to get it, can't seem to get it together, are struggling with poverty. So that's how. I mean, it's, it's, it's a racist thing. And then so when I kind of sit back now and I look about it, how the drug, the drug war is changing, you know, now that you have another drug, which is, um, I think it's meth. Is it meth? Yeah. yeah. Um, that's not affecting the black community very much. It's affecting the white community very much. But the same aspects of what it did to, to break it down and the destruction of that, of those families, the government is now, hey, maybe we can do it differently. Now I'm locking them up for 20 years, 50 years is no longer necessary. Maybe we should treat it as what it is, as a disease, and let's medically try to help these people out. You know, so that same treatment that was okay for my parents and my and growing up is now something to oh yeah, we can't do that now. So I mean that's just one hard example that you can see that how it directly affects the black community. And I'm an example of it. So like I'm very keen and sense to that um, for, as an example, so. No, that's, that's a great example, Alex. And I think the contrast between the way uh, crack and powder and then this difference in terms of how meth is treated today and to even talked about, it, it's not stigmatized the same way. It's a health disorder. It's a mental health thing, um, which again, people may not, see that as a racial thing, but it is grounded in disparate treatment. Uh, the other thing you can sprinkle on top of that that plays a part is this uh, notion of mass incarceration. Uh, it's directly connected to that war on drugs. It's why you have so many millions of African Americans in prison for nonviolent offenses. And it is driven by a $7 billion industry that has come out of nowhere in the private prison industry. It's not talked about, but it's funded, it's paid very heavily. It's grown from almost nothing to $7 billion almost overnight. And all you need to do is follow the money trail if you wanna see why we incarcerate so many people. Um, and this is, and, and because of that is, I think it's really important what Jack spoke about about the voting, the representation that we have. It's important for black people to be represented in these areas because that's how these laws are being made. You know, every law that's being made, like the gun law, war on drugs, any law that's out there, it directly affects the African American community first in a much heightened way than any other community. Because just like, like for example, stop and frisk that was in New York that when it got passed and got started, they weren't going to all the neighborhoods to stop and frisk. They targeted certain areas because if you follow the money, police officers, you know, they're incentivized to bring down a crime rate, to get arrests and things and so on and so on. So where are the easiest, what's, what's easy picking? It isn't like, no, even in Capel, it isn't coming to Capel to stop and frisk us here. Cause you know, if, if we're walking, we're at the park, you know, we're exercising, we're riding our bikes. We're not just loitering around the streets. You know, they're going to go to a different area to where poverty is at. And most poverty areas, you know, they're, they're minorities there. They're the blacks, the browns, the people who don't have the ability to pull themselves out of the poverty by themselves. So that's what's important to be part of that voting block. So I know that we don't frisk, at least I don't know that I've had an experience to be frisked, but I know my younger son um, was stopped. He was walking from a festival with um, a couple of his friends, and he was stopped by a police officer to inquire whether he um, was from the city or not. And I consider that stopped. He didn't frisk him. So I'm saying, huh. you know, it wasn't a frisk. But it is one of those situations where when I heard about it, you know, it was very frustrating to me as a mom to know that my child was approached in a crowd to say, do you belong in the city? Now, that was years ago. So I do want to say that because I do think the city has made a lot of progress in trying to recognize that the, the city is becoming more diversified. And I think the efforts with like allies and community and the other things that we mentioned earlier uh, is bringing forth the notion that the city does need to recognize the diversification and then start being more of servant leaders instead of policing the city. Um, but, you know, there are incidences that do occur where even in a city like Capel, 
you know, some of our kids are, are possibly stopped and, you know, when they, they, they need not be. Okay. Thank you. Um, here's one that talks about kids. What tactics can parents of young school age children employ to help their children's, their children be anti-racist? I would say don't teach them your racist ways <laughs> because I think kids grow up, you know, they learn from their parents. They learn to discriminate, to be racist. Any type of judgment they have, they learn from us as parents. So if we're able, and me and my wife talk about this all the time, you know, um, if we're able to not really put our influence on them in the sense of how we look at people or, or what we use certain terms and stuff, that really helps the kid because, you know, our kids are so pure that, you know, when they come home from school, they're talking like my, my, uh, my middle boy just started his first year was this year. And, you know, lucky for him, not lucky for him, but sadly for him, it was cut short because of the situation, but, you know, he would go to school and he would talk about all of his friends at school. And I would say, Hey, who's your best friend? He would just name off names. You know, he would, he would, he would tell what they're doing. He would never, he would never say that, oh, well, this black person or this white person or this Hispanic person or this or that. It was all just based on the characters about how that kid at school treated my kid, you know? And then, so I remember when my oldest boy, you know, I didn't really learn that lesson. You know, he's my first son. I was like, oh, how many black people do you have in your class? Or, you know, who's this and that? And it was just like this negative connotation that he already had. And I was like, I can't do that with this one, you know, like with my middle son. You know, so we purposely made, so it's really, as parents, like, don't teach them your racist ways. Because if you let a kid be a kid, they'll grow up, they'll love everybody, they'll, they'll treat people on the judgment of their character, not their skin color, not what people think of, perceived of them, things of that nature. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Yeah, Lawrence, I would offer this in, uh, I would offer this in put, uh, it's, very important that parents keep in mind that besides what parents say, kids are always observing and watching what you do. If you frown, if you show any type of resentment, they see that. That's stored and they will remember that. And that's become one of their tools in the toolbox for later. They hear what you said, but they generally do what you do. So uh, you have to do a reality check on self first and then speak with your uh, child and be prepared for you say it, or that's not what you did, or that's not what you said. So let's try to practice the appropriate outcome that you expected. That's, those are my comments. Thank you, Jack. And also, also exposing your, your children to uh, situations that allow them to digest and understand things that are happening today. So I guess a good example that I was very excited about was when we had the uh, Black Lives Matter march here in Capel. I saw um, white parents with their children in the march. And it's kind of going along with what Jack is saying as far as mimicking what you see, um, exposing your children to things that are a little bit, they, they can be serious um, topics, but they can also uh, watch how you handle things. And that allows them to start developing um, ideas about how they, they can be effective, especially when we talk about non-racist versus anti-racist. And anti-racist is basically being more proactive as opposed to being non-racist where, you know, you're not racist, but you're not really impacting racism in general. Um, but having your kids participate in things when, when possible, because we, we don't have those parades all the time, but, you know, in, in situations where you can involve your kids in things that are a little bit more serious, uh, allowing them to participate in the process has a, a big impact on how they look at themselves and how they choose to participate going forward in, in the community. Great. Thank you, Jacqueline. I, I'll add one more, and that is uh, build some meaningful relationships of your own with Black people and Black families. Uh, to the extent that you can do that, 
you will start to uh, build bridges for your kids um, that they might not see otherwise. So it's important not just to let this happen. It's great if it happens organically in the school system, but the numbers, quite frankly, are not going to be there in Capel to enable that necessarily. So you're also going to have to do some extra work as parents to inform yourself and to build relationships on your own that you can then help your, connect your kids to. So I think, I think that's an important thing that can be done. Um, here's one, uh, there is a significant diversity of thought and opinion about racial issues within the black community. What's being done within your own community to identify and resolve your issues? Well, I mean, I, I, I think there's one thing I, I would like to say is that I think there's a perception that I'm going to say African American, African Americans get together and talk about these types of topics, like as if there's a forum where this type of discussion is going on. And from my, my experience, there's not. So we see the different things that are happening in our communities and in, in the United States, but I'm not going to say that, you know, that there's some active discussion going on where we are discussing the, the various thought processes about what's happening and stuff like that. So um, I'm just speaking openly that, you know, that if, if you think we're behind the scenes thinking about all this stuff and talking about all this stuff, I, I don't personally know that that's always happening. So when you say, is the community taking care of their own problems, I think that might be a misnomer to, to assume that, that that's happening. Um, we do have political leaders. We have people who, you know, cover these topics and stuff like that. But I'm just talking from a, a personal level. Um, you know, I don't participate in racial discussions on a regular basis. Um, you know, so, you know, I just want to dispel the notion that that's a general conversation that's going on on a regular basis. I mean, you know, from a personal level, my husband and I may talk about it. Uh, my friends and I may talk about it, but it's not a community type solution that, that, that I can speak to. Now, like I said, I know we have leaders that are doing that and you are invited to things like we're having right now. You know, this is a, an opportunity to do some of that, but I just don't, don't have a personal experience of seeing that type of communication going on where we impact necessarily a community as a whole. Jacqueline, um, I think there is, and you kind of touched upon it, which you do do. Um, and I have to, to let people understand that there is two fronts that the black community, African American community, however community you want to call us, that we're fighting. That we that that's a challenge. Just there's a one that's forefront that we see every day on TV. You know, Black Lives Matter. You know, police brutality, um, segregation, discrimination. That we're constantly fighting against other people to say, hey, we are of value. Okay, and then there's another one that we have to fight. All this is because of the ramifications of slavery, of actually putting our families back together as a structure. You know, if you look at name any nationality out there um, from any part of the world, they have a family structure. There's a unit there. There's a community there, the Jewish community, the Hispanic community, the, um, tons of them, okay? As black people, you, know, you, talk about it, you, you talk about it with your husband, you talk about it with our friends. It's not something that second part, it's not something that we display on TV that we're always out there because really it doesn't necessarily, con not concern, but there's really nothing that the outside influence can really do to help that community, just like with any community out there, the Indian community, the, the Pakistani, the Iranian, there, there, there's nothing, it, it's really internal that needs to take place. And that's something that, yes, I can let you know that, yes, Black people in America, we are working on that, you know, you know we talk about it with our spouses, with our friends, with our family members, because we see the challenges that, that, yes, that, yes, if we conquer this other the outside one that's out there of discrimination and racism that's out there, if we conquer that and this is fixed and we, and that we still have another internal one 
to help make us whole. So there's two parts that we're fighting. So it's a constant battle. One is you don't see on TV because it's not necessarily that you can say, hey, I'm going to do, join the group to help black families or whatever you may think there is out there. You really can't do that. It's something that's internal, just like with any community out there. It's an internal thing that they come together, that, you know, that they begin to work, work for themselves. Now I can let you know through our history, yes, we did have that. You know, if you look at Tulsa, Oklahoma, you know, you call it Black Wall Street. That was the system that was there. Like we're trying to get back to that system that to where our dollar goes in the community more than once. It doesn't leave our community, you know, just like any other community. So there's so there are and we are working on both. But it's a two we we are we're fighting two wars at once. So the one that you're seeing is the one that we want that's kind of important. So yeah. Okay. Jack, anything? Uh yes. Uh... I would uh, state that the black experience is uh, uniquely different uh, for each individual. Uh, now, racism, uh, well, is in the black community is basically a subset of the larger community uh, and it mirrors that larger community. Now, systemic racism and institutional racism, they rooted in doing things the way they've always been done. Uh, based on skin color, hair, hierarchy, geography, tokenism, segregation, and African-American versus Black. Those are all subset of the larger uh, racism issue in the country. And if you, if you buy into some trickle down, if you resolve the larger issue, it will also influence the uh, changes in the subset of that larger issue. Those are my comments on that. Thank you, Jack. I think, um, you know, part of that, I, I read into this question, one that I often hear on this topic, uh, we'll get back to things like, well, what about black on black crime? What about uh, the murder rate? And if you really do your homework, what you'll find is there really isn't a difference in black on black crime from white on white crime and Hispanic on Hispanic crime, if you look at the numbers, there are not statistically relevant differences in, in those occurrences. However, one gets stigmatized in the media very differently um, and has for decades. And that's the one that shapes stereotypes and views and, and those things get sustained. The other thing I think that's important, Jack made the point, it, it's kind of a trickle down effect if you fix some of the systemic issues, then potentially some of these other things will improve as well. Um, the thing I always like to, frankly, very pointedly remind people of is that this issue of racism is not black people's issue to fix. You would not, you would not ask a battered wife to fix the battery. You wouldn't say to a battered spouse, that you need to fix your behavior, that you're causing this somehow. Actually, they, that self-blame happens a lot among victims in that space. But this thing is, this is not, this is incumbent upon white America to kind of figure out and, and rectify. And, and black people clearly need to do their part. But, but I think everybody's got to get clear about if this is going to change, it's got to change based on the impetus of folks becoming anti-racist and moving this thing forward on behalf of their brethren in the community, um, in this particular instance, being Black. Um, let me see if I can find another one here. Um, what are your thoughts about defunding the police? What would you fund instead? I'll come in on that. Now, uh, defunding the police, I, th I think the language that's being used is what's uh, uh, distorting everything here. Now, I can draw a scenario, a comparison between uh, the institution of the police department, uh, uh, law enforcement, and the institution of education. And I'm going to bring it home to the state of Texas. Now, 
in the state of Texas, uh, uh, if you get a school district that's not performing up to standards set by the state of Texas or a given school, they reconstitute that. That basically means they fire everybody and hire new people or they shift things around, move people out, move people in to make it better. Now, now I I feel relatively sure that uh, that's the position most people are, are, are looking at as far as if the police uh, department is not working as it should, then you've got to make some changes there. Defunding, no, that's, that's, that's not reality. You don't just defund something, but uh, there's always, this is the cliche, always room for improvement. Well, you should always be working toward making things better. Now, uh, it's clearly obvious that there are some things are not working, training is not taking place, uh, training not being followed, and those issues have to be addressed. There's a saying, you want to fire in the hiring process. Those are my comments on that, but I'm definitely opposed to this idea of defunding police. Uh, I think it's a language and a communication issue as to what you're trying to accomplish. Thank you, Jack. Well, that and, and also um, anything that, any major initiative that we're trying to accomplish takes planning um, and direction. And I think the the slogan defund, defund police, I, I don't feel right now that it has a complete um, plan behind it where people can understand what it actually means. Um, but I was listening to a program recently where um, a city somewhere in the Northeast actually fired everybody and rehired in the police department. So they had to interview for their jobs. And interestingly enough, I went through something similar to that on a job before where um, when it was a, when Texas became an at will, higher at will state where you weren't uh, an employee for life, some companies went through, okay, we're gonna basically fire you and rehire you. You have to re-interview for your positions and stuff like that. That's the process that they used in this town that I'm referring to for what they considered defunding and reorganizing the police. They literally had a complete overhaul and re-interviewing of police officers to determine which one fit the new direction that they were taking. And so this notion of defunding police, I just think it needs definition, planning, execution, so that it's not just some flashy phrase that, that's out there and people are trying to figure out what it means and whether they agree with it or not or disagree with it. Um, but I just personally feel that it needs a little bit more meat and, and structure around it so that people can buy into the notion of if we need to overhaul or change some police systems or some police departments, that that can be a vehicle to, to take care of that particular topic. Thank you. Jack, Alex? Uh, again, yeah, I, I agree. I think the word defund, we need to really not use that because like Jack said, that doesn't make any sense. Like it, it just doesn't. I think we need to reconstitute what it is to be a, um, to be a police department. You know, the police were started to do one thing, to protect people's property. And, and, and that's, that's what their job was when it, when it started years and years ago. Um, so when you look at it today, you know, they're having to be, you know, psychologists, <laughs> you know, mediators, all these different things that we're kind of asking these departments to do, these police officers to do. And then at the same time, you know, uh, the people that are, who are becoming police officers, you know, are they really receiving the proper training to do these things? You know, so I think the, I think in some aspects of it, you know, there, we do have bad policing and there's bad officers out there and, and it's, it's a fact, but at the same time, I think the whole as um, sometimes can be, sometimes can be used as an scapegoat to really push the blame on the people that's above them, that are setting the policies, that um, which is our legislation, you know, our government. That, you know, I, I think that's where it needs to. I, I think that's where the issue really lies. I think if we 
if we understand what do we want our police officers to do? You know, do we want them to protect and serve as you know, all their badges says, or do we want them to protect our property? Or do we want them to be counselors? Or do we want them to be um, going out, rounding up kids and sending them to school? Like there's some officers, that's their job. You know, they're out there to go find kids who are not in school and send them to school and th things of that nature and stuff. So we, as a, as a society, we have to really have a true understanding about what do we want our policing to, to look like. Um, in some cases, they may need more funding in some areas. Some areas, they may need less funding. You know, me personally, I don't, I don't think we need police officers to look like soldiers <laughs> when they're patrolling the streets, when they're doing things. And that's just, that's just my personal belief. I, I, don't, I don't think it's necessary. You know, there's many societies throughout the, throughout the globe who, you know, the police officers don't, some don't even have weapons, not, not weapons, but like guns, or, for example, you know. So I think we need to really understand like what it is, what it, what it means to be a police officer in America and how we want to be police ourselves. Because at the same time, again, we are paying for this service. These are our tax dollars. These are our representatives that are putting this in place and saying, hey, this is, this is what you're gonna police yourself. So to defund it, no, I think we need to read constitution what it is to be a police officer. Thanks, Alex. And I think that's, that's, that's a great way to talk about it, I think. Yeah, I wish I wish the marketing genius who came up with defund the police would have come up with reimagining what policing could be or something like that. But whoever came up with that needs to give the money back because <laughs> that was not a good marketing. Um, I think it hurts the cause more than anything oh, because absolutely. you know you you have some police officers who are out there like or families of police officers like it just when you say that you're automatically just blaming them and. You want to attack them, and that's how I don't think that's what we want to do. That's not you what know. it's about. No, that's it's true. not what it's about. No. But you have to go do homework to figure that out, and that's unfortunate. That's so true. let's do this. We have, by my count, five minutes, four minutes now to go. I'm going to ask each of you, if you would, to give us your thoughts about maybe I'll, I'll tee it up this way. Um, what's your What's your biggest hope coming out of all of this? And and I'm going to ask you to do that in less than a minute. So. So that we'll go back in the same order. Jacqueline, I'll ask you to start. Um, my biggest hope and why I was excited about participating was, I mean, I just, I just want people to know that African-American people are just like you. I mean, if we look at each other as human beings, start from the human perspective and, and think of us as everyday people. I mean, when you try to, 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 to understand what it might be to have the African-American experience and what we're talking about today, I don't think anybody who's not African-American will ever really know what that's like. So start from what is it like just to be human? <laughs> I mean, that's how I look at it. I mean, I look at it as take me as I am, face value. I, I take people as they are on face value, regardless of their race. So you, what I decide as far as who I'm going to associate with or, or, or interact with is based solely on, on their own personal perspective and, and the way they behave as a, as a human being. So I just don't think there's any way to really tell a person, you know, what is it, what is it like to interact with a black person or what is it like to be around a black person? I would just say, treat us like everybody else and that way you'll have an opportunity to get to know everybody regardless of their their race and background so i wanted to participate just to say you know um i think the city of capel has has made great strides in having opportunities like this for people to meet and talk about these types of conversations and again i just feel like if everybody looks at it from a human perspective um, instead of trying to figure out, uh, you know, what is it like to be black or what is it like to be a woman or what is it like to be Iranian or whatever the different races are, just take the race completely out of it and, and think about people as people. Thank you, Jacqueline. Jack? Okay. Uh, well, uh, I envision a future where we uh, move forward with uh, the races side by side, not necessarily anyone walking out front or anyone walking behind. Now that's not to say that at any given point in time that one group did not take the lead for the rest of the group. So uh, I envision the, the, the future where uh, we're together, we're comfortable, and we can uh, walk down the street uh, uh, and 
greet each other without having to cross the uh, cross the street out of fear or, or apprehension. Uh, certainly, I also hope that, and I want to hope and encourage people to uh, accept the uh, guidance of, of our physicians. Uh, I take the position that uh, I'm alive along with the other seniors. I fit in that category. I still have a problem dealing with the idea of seniors, uh, the, the term senior, but uh, I encourage that because there would be a lot of seniors going on to the hereafter if we had not, or if we do not follow the advice of our physicians. Uh, as one of my physicians said, the only reason you are alive is because you've been real good at following doctor's orders. So I encourage you all to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Alex. Um, as a member of the Baha'i Faith and Baha'i Community in Capella, Texas. Um, one of the most challenging issues to America is racism. Um, and my goal and my hope, as I see the future, um, is that we really tackle it head on, you know, and there's really two parts of it to really tackle it, is, is a recognition of it to say that it exists. Um, and, another rec and, and then a forgiveness part of it. And I think us as a black people, we're, for, we're very forgiving people. You look out through history, we're just forgiving, you know. Um, and I think if, 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 if we come together in the sense of, as black people, be willing to be patient with our counterparts um, in the sense of asking questions and, and, and learning more about it and be open to it and not be so like, oh, I don't want to tell you, you should know, you, or, you know, go read. No, we'll help you. I help. I'll act, I answer the questions for you that, to, but to the best of my ability. If not, I'll give you to Jacqueline or Mr. Jack here. <laughs> they have some really great insight too. But it's, it's to more to want to, to wanna know. I feel that if there's any, if there's an issue that's out there, if you really truly want to fix it, you really want to know about it. You really want to try to understand what the issues are, not to have a preconceived notion about it, not listen to this political party, that political party, this news station, that, you know, to really dig in and do the work yourself. Um, and I think, like, that's, that's my hope. And I, and, I, and I really see it, you know, it's weird. When I first went into, into the power, I was very, very guarded about this community. My wife wanted to move, I was like, oh, I don't know about this. You know, there's a lot of white people here. You know, I know they are, this, this, and that. And then it came to a point that, you know, like now, like I see change. I see people like they're wanting to. They're wanting to know, they're, they're more open. So I, get, I, so I say to the people out there, just be open. Be open to the experiences, you know, like Ms. Lawrence says, through any nationality, any background of people. So just expose yourself to this here. And then I, I think it, it'll, it'll, come a, it'll come a long way in helping our community be stronger, which it is. So. Thank you, Alex. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close by calling for and asking for people to embrace what I'm going to call constructive impatience. So like I talked about in the beginning, this thing's been with us for a while. And if you are objective about it and you think about America and its potential, this thing has held us back. I don't think there's any way you could look at it and, and not see this as something that has been a, um, a governor on the ability for this country to move forward. And so if you think about how great this country has been and all the things that have been achieved, imagine how great we could be if we were truly capitalizing on all the resources and, and letting everybody play in a, in a system that is just and, and, and treats people the way they deserve to be treated. So I don't think as a nation we can afford to keep limping along with this thing without getting passed by a lot of other folks very soon. And I think it's time for us to get our act together, figure this out, understand that we, if we are to be the United States of America, this is the one we have to be. We have to tackle this issue, this disease. And if we can do that, there's nothing I see that's in our way from truly achieving the ideals that we've set forth as a country.
So I want to thank the uh, Coppell Community Builders for this time and for sponsoring this and the panelists for uh, devoting their time and giving their, their perspectives and being open about what their experiences are and to the people on, online who stayed with us and asked all these questions. I put a couple of links in for people who asked about resources. Um, There's some resources on, on anti-racism. I put a couple of links in for folks to, to pursue that. So look in the answer part of the Q&A for that. And that's it. Thank you, folks. We appreciate it. Thank you. So Frank has his hand raised, but I don't know what to do with that. Frank, where are you? <laughs> Sarah, are you still know. on? Yes, I, I, think, some... I think I can unmute Frank and he can ask a question. Hold on one second. If I can find him, there he is. Okay, Frank, you can say something. You should be unmuted. I think he has to unmute himself now. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. I think so. Uh, I was reading, Lawrence, I was reading the questions about, um, one of the questions was about um, the integration of the school system in Capel when it comes to black teachers, coaches, and things of that nature. Yeah. And I'm going to, I want to touch on this just briefly. Um, my my sister-in-law, she's a teacher at Town Center here in Capel. And she works on the committee to where their concerts are going out and really trying to make the school more diverse when it comes to teachers and stuff like that. And I know one of the challenges that she said that she had is that, you know, when they would go out to these, um, what is it, school shows, things of that nature, that uh, a lot of minorities, they just would automatically dis dismiss Capel because like, oh, yeah, it's a white community. We're not going to go there. They're never going to hire me and stuff. So. The, so I can say that, yeah, the challenges, there are challenges on both parts of bringing them in, but also going out and recruiting them. So um, I say that if you do know people of minority, different background, not just Black, Hispanic, um, Indian, Asian, if you do know these people that are teachers and stuff, you know, point them to Capel. Like I would say that, please do, because I think it only benefits us as a society, as a community, much better to have different backgrounds of teachers teaching our kids. Thanks, Alex. So can you, so can Frank, you hear me now? There? Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So thank you all. You did a great job. Uh, and, and Lawrence, you know, you teed it up with the video and the presentation. And each one of you, uh, I appreciate your, uh, where you came from, too, uh, Jackie being in uh, integrated school. Uh, Jack, uh, you know, I've, I've read about the poll tax, but I never knew anybody who was actually familiar with how that worked. Um, and then outcome from the projects and what you've done with yourself is just incredible so thank you all for for your time and efforts and my question that i tried to send was and it has to do with resources what you know to move people from being a non-racist to being an anti-racist to be more active what sort of next steps going to the to the um uh black lives matter march obviously that's one thing but what what are some of the things you guys would point us to as far as taking next steps I think I think one key is is education, Frank. There's there's been so much uh, misinformation. I, I out of frustration, uh, I started digging into this around when when the George Floyd thing came about, and I wasn't totally um, a novice in terms of looking into uh, research on this, but but I started doing a lot more digging, and and there's I mean, this thing is just deep. It's deep, it's complicated, there's a lot of layers to it. And there's been a lot of work done to paint a picture that has been fed to people in a way that has resulted in the way people think about this. So this is not coincidental, it's not by happenstance. And so I think, I think folks have to be curious, they have to get educated, they have to arm themselves with facts and be able to then, that gives you ability to step into things as an anti-racist if you are coming from a position of knowledge and fact. Because now you can dispel some of these stereotypes and some of the things that are thrown out as yeah buts 
when folks want to come at this and say, yeah, but what about? If you know more about this, you can, you can address those things and dispel some of these uh, misnomers. Yeah, I'll give you a quick example is, is around the issue of black fatherhood. And to my surprise, the CDC has actually studied black fatherhood. There's a study done by the CDC that shows black fathers are every bit as engaged and involved in their kids' lives as white fathers. In fact, uh, you'll even find places where black fathers uh, outpace their white, white counterparts in terms of things like reading to their kids, changing diapers, these kinds of things. You would never know that by the narrative that has been set in motion in the media. But you, so that's an example to me of how we have to go learn this stuff, figure it out, and be able to come from a position of knowledge as opposed to just accepting things at face value. Yeah, I think you're right. And just, just doing little things, like if you're in a conversation as a white person and someone's telling a story and they, they describe whatever happened to them as a black person, I'll say, why does that matter? You know, that, that's not part of the story. So it's just, uh, I think those kinds of things we can continue to do and, and grow on. I was glad to hear you guys all, um, your interpretation of the fund the police. I think that's been a very, uh, uh, this decisive, divisive, you know, um, narrative out there. So I, I agree with all of you and every black person I've talked to agrees with what, the way you teed it up in terms of reforming it. If that means rehiring people or, or whatever that means, but uh, defunding is just not, doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So that was it. I thought y'all did a great yeah. job. Is there, I wonder, uh, I think Sarah uh, did record this. And yeah, maybe it's being can, recorded. And maybe Sarah, we can do a, uh, maybe get, I don't know if it's possible, but do a, somehow publish the Q and A's maybe. Um, I don't know if that's be too difficult to do or not, but I, I thought that there were some great questions and some great answers. Yeah, I can look into a way that we can do that. Okay, well, I'm gonna leave you guys alone. Let, let you have the rest of your Saturday. Thanks, Frank. Believe, believe it or not, I'm going to another Zoom call right after <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks again. Okay, guys. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys so much. It was wonderful. Thank I you. really appreciate it. You did a wonderful job. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for Bye -bye. allowing us to do this. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.